thank you guys for joining us. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, I'm Carlos Aguilar. I'm a film critic here in Los Angeles, and I'm very excited to be chatting tonight with the directors of The Wolf House, uh, Joaquin Cosina and Cristobal Leon. Uh, this is their debut feature, and for, you know, hopefully you guys had a chance to see it. It's been out for almost a week now through virtual cinema. And, you know, it's a unique experience. It's, it's hard to describe, but I think that for, yeah. you know, for all, hopefully all of you that have seen the film uh, can agree that it is, it's phenomenal and it's, you know, an, a unique experience in terms of animation or any sort of storytelling in general. Um, so thank you for joining us, Joaquin and Cristobal from, from Chile, correct? That's where you guys are joining from? Yeah, that's correct. Thanks, Juan yeah. Carlos, for having us here. Um, so I'll go ahead and start, you know, as people join us in this sort of like now that we've shifted from Facebook Live to the, the Zoom uh, conversation, hopefully people are joining us now. Um, I know that, you know, people get so caught up in the fact that is this inspired by, you know, the Colonia Dignidad in Chile and this whole chapter in Chilean history. But you've talked, you know, uh, at length at the fact that it sort of it was inspired, but it's not sort of trying to recreate or specifically talk about that chapter. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to ask, why did you feel that the, the structure or the tropes, the sort of ideas of fairy tales uh, were perfect to touch this sort of, you know, uh, a cult or a colony where there's manipulation and sort of like this uh, ideologies of control? What was it about the fairy tale that felt like the right approach for this story? Do you want to start, Joaquin? No, I mean, if you already start, so go on. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, well, the, the thing is, like, and it's, it's, it's not so much that we had the, the, this, this subject, the subject of colonial dignidad, and, and we kind of um, apply um, a layer, like kind, kind of a Photoshop layer of, um, or filter of a stop motion fairy tale or animation fairy tale. Okay. Um, it was, more, it was more chaotic. Our process was way more chaotic. I think we, we started with, with the idea of actually doing a fairy tale and then the opposite occurred. Like the, the subject of colonial dignidad started to uh, infiltrate our script as a kind of virus. Like, um, so we, we, we had the idea of doing this kind of fairy tale made by a sect and then slowly we realized that, we, that the sect we were talking about or the, the sect was actually colonial dignidad. So we were trying to, uh, to, to, um, yeah, to create some kind of metaphors for colonial dignidad, but, but then we decided to uh, speak directly about it. So it was, it was more chaotic than, than that, I would say. It was more organic. Uh, um, I think I think also like it's um, animation and fairy tales for us work as a very like um, useful approach to to like historical trauma in in Chile or historical trauma because we can talk about these subjects in an well as you said in the in the question in a non historical way in a more like subjective and maybe because it is subjective in a in a deeper way. You know, um, yeah. I don't know if Joaquin wants to. Yeah, may maybe I want to. I want to say something like really straightforward. That basically we start this uh, this film production with a one script, and the script was completely different at the end, like completely different. So we didn't have like this like a uh, script pre-production, production, post-production post structure. So because we. The film was produced like during five years. Uh, we were like talking about the ideas and the scenes and the subject and blah blah for five years. So it was in a way uh, like a super slow improvisation. And in that process, like the sect that you are talking about, Colonia Dignidad and Paul Schaffer, uh, kind of pop up slowly in the conversations and starts to change the script during the production but that was thanks to our chaotic way of working and also thanks to the super slow production uh, like super slow top motion system there is something that there are many other things i'm thinking now that there is also the, the, the fact that the, um, 
we were talking about this German sect, this German cult, and and usually like personally, I I think like I I relate fairy tales with the German culture. I mean like. Uh, you, you you think when you think about fairy tales, you think immediately about like uh, Green Brothers or mm -hmm. this. So it seems to be a very like Central European thing um, to tell to tell stories with uh, through fairy tales. And also like it, it was the fact that the the the, the colony itself uh, tried to project a fake image uh, of themselves. Um, as a kind of fairy tale, like it, they, they were doing this kind of very, very elaborated uh, storytelling of a, like a idealized or fake um, image of, of the of the life within the colony. You know, it was completely fake. They they, they would represent themselves through videos um, of like happy families when the reality was completely the opposite. That like men and women were completely separated within the colony. And, and 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 they they would live in conditions almost of a slavery. So they they had this uh, like permanent construction of a of a fake image, and and it was pretty much as a like a like a fairy tale. And and finally, I think we wanted to to make like our first uh, full length animated film, and it was like like when you think about like like a feature animate animation film you think about uh, Miyazaki or Walt Disney in the case of of like uh, the US and and then we wanted to make our like to create our like Latin American tradition of animation fairy tales you know like like uh, animation is so like like uh, closely re related to fairy tales i think and, and and we wanted to make the Latin American version and the Latin American version has to include um like political horror, uh, racism, uh, fascism, I don't know, like all, all, all these things have to be inside, I think. So I think that, yeah. just, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, basically, just to complete what Christopher was saying, when we were thinking in that terms, we realized, okay, what will be funny, uh, which Walt Disney will we have in Chile? Uh, which, we will be, which one will be this? It's the South American or Chilean Walt Disney, yeah. and we thought it was funny uh -huh. in, a, of course, dark way, that Paul Schaeffer, the like the pedophile leader of a German sect in the south of Chile, will be a perfect like Walt Disney for us. Um, with that in mind, you know, I feel like in in general, the purpose of fairy tales are you know to teach something to children or to pass on a lesson and there's a there's a level of control in that right like the if you don't do something this could happen to you the fairy tale is sort of like a warning for the child like and i feel like to an extent you know the figure the parental figure of the person that knows better than you in this case the wolf you know it's very interesting to me how you know we've all in, in our own context being sort of victims of fairy tales right into you know the legends that our parents tell you if you don't do this this monster is going to come for you or something terrible is going to happen to you was that in your mind the idea of like how fairy tales and these stories are used to to an extent by you know by everyone uh to you know show control or to exercise that sort of manipulation on others well yes i i think fairy tales have had different uses in like in different ages you know but but like originally they were only like folk tales like tales in the tradition but but they have been used a lot as indoctrinating stories as you say and 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 that was of course in our mind because the film itself is uh, was made by the leader of this cult actually we thought this this film made by paul sheffer if you maybe that's that's not something very obvious, and some people don't understand this just watching the film, but that was the, the, our intention like so we were trying to dress the skin of this um, of this very pervert leader and and making the film that was in in his mind uh, so yeah, this film we thought it as a as a like an indoctrinating uh, film for for the people in the community like in like to teach them that escaping the community is a bad thing to do. Right. Um, I don't know if uh, Cristobal can you, sorry, uh, Joaquin, can you see us? I cannot see you, but I'm just checking. Yeah, I'm you here. Can see Maybe you can see me now. Uh, I can no. see. Okay, he can see you. Okay, so maybe it's just me. 
Um, I, I learned that the film was, you know, the production of the film itself was made in 10 different cities between Latin America and Europe at exhibits, sort of like you're producing this film in front of an audience or in front of like people that went into these places. How did that, you know, tell us a little about the decision of making the film in that way, sort of like in a public space, you know, in yeah. different cities and how did that affect, you know, the production, and the creative process of the film? Okay, it's a long story, but starts with an declaration. I mean, it's like we 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 went to the art school, and we are also like visual artists. So for us to make shows is not something like extraordinary. It's more like a regular way of showing our work. Um, so we are filmmakers, animators, and visual artists too. And when we started to produce the Wolf House, we were locked in our studio. And uh, af like, I think that after a month, like working in the studio, we realized that we would spend like a lot of time, you know, like in the basement working by ourselves. And that we, ha we needed to have like all our mind in the project, but at the same time, we were, get we were having all this, like we were receiving all these invitations, not many, but some to make shows or to be participating in like galleries or museums. So that was one reason that we said like, okay, we have two options. We can stay locked for years in our studio or we can do something with this project in the open, you know, like an open space or, or the, in the gallery environment or the museum environment. That was one reason to kind of like transform the studio in an open work, in an open, you know, in a show. Hello. <laughs> um, Are these the artists? I think yeah, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So what, 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 that's what, that was one of the reasons. And the other reason was that when we, while we were working in the, in the studio, as you can see in the film, it's quite chaotic and beautiful in the way that that they, all the materials explode and transform and everything. So at some point we decided that we want to share that process. You know, we want to, to make shows, like art shows, that are not like, uh, like something like our studio, but really our studio. So we decided to move our studio to all the places we were invited to show. So if you're a creator and you said like, hey, do you want to show some paintings? No. We will not show paintings, we will show our studio. We'll move to your museum for one month and you will have to receive us and we'll be working on our film. We did that once thinking that actually will be uh, something that will be rejected. And for some strange reason, everyone liked the idea. So we spent like three or four years basically jumping from one museum to another. Uh, and that, yeah, well, I will say that and Crystal can continue with the story. I think. Oh, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. I mean, was it was that disruptive to, to have to move the production from place to place? Did that sort of like disrupt the, the process of... No, 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 no. Yeah, but, it, but also it kind of um, ventilate, can you say, ventilar, meant like kind of like, uh, like made it more like, made it nicer, I think, like, because it was, it wasn't like, like such a claustrophobic experience, but it was more something that we could share. And, and it was also like a very good school for us as, as visual artists, because we learned, I don't know, like musicians and people from theater normally have the experience of like uh, the, the audience, like the live audience, you know, and, but we as visual artists, we don't. So like this was, we, we could meet almost every person that would come in in the exhibition, you know, so that was a very, a very good school to to learn like the like the real scale of of what we what we are doing as artists you know that, that was it was a great school also you know that the, the idea of showing the process and showing the um, the bones of our work is in the is it's, it's like the seed of of what we started doing like i don't know when we started working together with Joaquin, we started more than uh, around 15 years ago and we made this uh, short film and we had this, this very simple idea in mind of like making uh, an animation movie about the process of making a drawing and erasing a drawing. And then 
like showing the process of making a film in a, in a gallery or museum was like exactly like a continuation of that, you know, like of like mm -hmm. exhibiting our process of showing openly our process, you know. Right. You know, with stop motion animation, you know, I feel like uh, people have the idea of what they've seen in, you know, in mostly like American productions that there's a figure with an armature, like a metal armature, and that you bend that to make motion or you change the faces, you know, but with what you guys are doing, it's sort of like a, the material destroys itself in front of our eyes and then it rebuilds, you know, and it transforms and some, it's painting and it's physical, at times it's tangible and times it's flat. Can you tell us a little about the process of and the intention behind, you know, working with the materials in the ways that, that you guys did in the film? Well, I think there are many, many things around that. The one thing that it's, uh, that one thing I want to say is that this, the film have two like narratives. One narrative is the one that tells the story of Maria, who escapes from the colony and goes into the house and blah, blah, blah. Well, the long blah, 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 of course. Uh, okay. But there's another story, which is the story of the materials. It's more like a performatic documentary way of uh, narrating. We, we feel that, that one narrative of the film is like a, documentary, like a document of how materials change and transform. And also, it's a, like a record of how we were like transforming the space. So, well, basically that's one of the lines. And the other line is that for me, one of the main things that I like about stop motion is that when you see stop motion, you're basically not seeing the most important part of the image, which is the human being and the energy moving the things. So when you have like a doll and you see, you know, the doll moving, like basically what you are not seeing is the human being behind and all the energy maybe you know like moving that and so i think our film is in a way about that energy or about us moving around the studio you know and transforming the things and we really wanted to 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 show all that energy and all the bones as cristobal said of how we do how are we doing this how this is going to how is this happening so we love to show the wires and the paintings and you know the, the mistakes and all the things that are going on because we we feel that that's the energy of the stop motion like the like the basement of the stop motion for for me at least and i think for cristobal too is the most interesting part of it like all the energy the surrounding the movements you know when, um, when we started when we started doing the animation, we like the day the day we start actually, uh, we um, we wrote a decalogue like our ten command commandments of animation, like of, of the animation of La Casa Lobo, of the Wolf House, and one of them, one of the rules was um, like everything can be transformed as a sculpture, and other one was like there are no puppets. Of course, the the film is full of puppets, you know, but but then we. Uh, really tried hard to imagine them as like matter and not um, and not puppets, you know. Like and and we wanted like like a table can be transformed as a sculptor uh, can be I don't know how do you say like uh, go away and and like a, a body too and and this is because we imagine the film as a dream, you know, and and we we imagine the film as a mental universe and and we thought that like everything in the film is is like mental energy and everything can appear and disappear and 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 we also imagine the film as like the transition between images you know like images coming from like to to the memory so we were not so focused in this case when we animated in like in trying to produce a naturalistic animation but more like to to think about how you go from one image to another image or how would this happen in your mind, you know? I love the moments that goes in where there's, there's moments in the film where a character is half painting and half a physical element, like half of a body is the, perhaps the legs sticking out from the wall and half of this flat painting. What was the intention behind, you know, having these characters exist in these two sort of like elements, you know, as flat images and as physical beings? At the beginning of the process, we supposed to make a film that was going from like 2D to 3D. That was then like the like intellect the intellectual, you know, plan of the film. But of, of course, that all fell apart. Like super, yeah. Like the first day, we were not 
like going like doing that. Uh, there is like uh, there there is one rule in the this uh, ten rules that we we write down the first day of production that it says like it's painting on camera, so basically it should work on the on the screen. It doesn't really matter if it's like like a puppet or painting or you know like uh, as painting. Like when, when you see like a Rembrandt painting, you know, you have this face, which is like, like, like a, the old Rembrandt, you have like the face, which is like, you can see all the details. And then you have the hand which is basically like, a, just like some painting super fast. And, but you still see like a, like a, you know, like an old lady looking to the window, but you can actually, at the same time, you can see the hand, which is not a hand at all. Um, so I see myself now, it's really like strange. Okay. Um, so we were trying to, we were, we were like really improvising based on what we were looking at the small screen in the camera, you know? So we said, okay, okay, it, it, it needs another arm. So we will paint the arm in the background, even if the puppet was in the front. Because it was in a way it was more easy to do painting on the back on the back of the of the studio. That's one one thing. And the other thing is like we were trying to also make magic in a way. We we really like the beginning of films of, of, of film history. You know, when you have Melier and all these like filmmakers who were basically magicians trying to use film to kind of like make his magic theater bigger. So we really try to make this like a magic tricks. Right. Then there's a moment in the film in which the characters actually become uh, like felt puppets, like they're made of fabric. Was an intention, it's, it's brief near the end, but it was there an intention to show these characters in this more actually physical form as, as fabric uh, puppets? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I think something, we see, we think the film a lot like uh, often like a comedy, like you know, like of course yeah. it, it seems to be like a very like a, like a dark film, and it, like people think think of it as a horror film, but we we take a lot of decisions because it they, they seem funny to us, and you know that we we are very like um, inspired by. Ranking bass animation, you know, like the Jack Frost, like mm -hmm. old like Christmas, the special animations, and or, or the, the, there used to be like this, also like this uh, stop motion, like the, the, maybe the the pioneer of stop motion in or or the only example of stop motion in Chile was this um, animation to go to sleep like at nine o'clock or something, and it was like like puppets kind of like this. Mm -hmm. We wanted to to make something because it, the film it's so like experimental that we wanted to have a moment that was really like a like a more trying like failing of course but trying to make a more like a, like a normal stop motion also <laughs> because, like something that Joaquin didn't mention in the in the but a reason because we we, we combine like three dimensional solutions and like painting uh, solutions is also because we like a question that we repeat to be between ourselves a lot in the in the studio is like what we feel like doing you know like it's it's not what is best but like, like we we take a lot of decisions because we we feel we simply feel like doing something and like very instinctively and and like we try to 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 bring something new to every scene we tried very hard like to let's make this one like very realistic like let's make this one like more cartoonish or you know and and for those species like two scenes that are more like a kind of cute puppets we yeah we maybe we were a bit tired of doing like kind of experimental stuff and we wanted to try to make something more like, <laughs> um uh, i also read that there's that there were rules for the sound design that you, your your sound designer had his own rules to create and use the sounds and the and create the world in a sonic way you want to tell us a little bit about what, what the approach was for that well we worked the sound mainly with uh, claudio vargas uh, who was he's this is the first 
like a proper like future film that he made like the sound design and we worked with him for two main reasons one is because we, we heard at some point like some really nice experimental thing that he was doing basically like he he designed some sounds and he gave these sounds to filmmakers to to add images to that sound which is basically the opposite of the normal way of doing it so we, th we thought, okay, this is a really nice way of thinking about sound. Uh, and the other reason is that uh, he was um, open to work with us as long as it takes. So he said like, you know, a regular like sound designer will tell you like, okay, I give you like uh, five days, seven days, and we will make a super cool work, super efficient, blah, blah, blah. And with Claudio was five years. So we, he was like working with us, 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 you know, like, uh, like for five years, less hours than us, I would, I would, I would assume. But we were like, uh, so Claudio at some point, he, he realized that we were working with 10 rules, like technical rules. So he said, okay, I will make my own 10 rules to, to make the sound. And he made like, yeah, like a lot of rules, but, one of the rules was like none of them none of the sounds will be like downloaded from a like a free or paid like uh you know like uh how you say that like an online resource so he will produce yeah. all the sounds in his apartment with his son like you know scratching the walls or like taking papers you know like things like that so all the sounds that you hear, like 90% of the sound that you hear in the film are like produced by Claudio in his apartment. You know, and, Claudio, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Go. No, Claudio go, was very go. smart and understanding something that we, that we wanted to do with the film that was like uh, permanently having these two narratives, like moving between these two narratives of, of the materials in one hand and the story itself like the story of maria so like he he took the decisions to like um, to design this to to make this sound design not not always always to the story but a lot of times like creating sound for the material so you know because with animation you don't have like yeah. ink sound of course and so so he tried to create how paper uh, sounds and uh, like how how is the sound of painting uh, running through the walls you know that, that you you can only imagine this this because it you, you don't have the experience of um hearing this in your life so so he was a lot like like working very hard at the beginning of the process trying to to finding the best sound for masking tape like for the painting on the wall for charcoal drawings moving and growing on the walls you know like and, and this was a very interesting process i think and, and he was like as joaquin said like working with him with his child at, at home like like moving papers like wrapping things and like yeah like super interesting so it, it took five years to produce which is incredible and you have you know sort of like i don't want to say simple but the materials that you use are you know materials that are perhaps you know not the most expensive, but they're used in a way that create this incredible world. So tell us a little about the actual process of creating, how the, the labor was divided between the two, who painted what, who created what character. How was that, you know, how intensive was that to create the actual works manually, but by hand? Well, we don't, like, we don't, we don't have separate roles, or at least we didn't, we haven't had it separate roles like in our works so far and we like we have this one rule in our studio that is like everything that comes in our studio can be like changed by the two of us so we don't only like uh, make films but also we make paintings together and it works like this you know like it worked like I, I make a painting and then I come the other day and Joaquin was there in the morning and he changed completely the painting and it was the same with the with the animation because we we didn't we were not always at the same time in the studio so i i would leave the animation at one point in the evening and then joaquin would come very early in the morning and work on it and then i would come on the afternoon and find a completely different thing so 
yeah, we, don't, we both do the camera work. We both do the sculpture and painting and animation. And yeah, we don't work with separate roles actually. Yeah, and talking about the materials, like uh, the kind of, but you also, also ask about the materials, no? Like the kind right. of materials. Yeah, well, we use the cheapest thing that we could find. That was the rule. We, we, we have this like kind of a rule that, or the tendency, we have this tendency, tendency that we prefer to do things that we like coming from trash and like cheap things and trashy things. Uh, we try to come transform that into beauty and not the opposite. And I think that's a political statement too. Like because we are in the visual art world too, you, when you, when I see like visual art from the state, sorry, states now, but also Europe, like richer countries, uh, there are many artists that work with a lot of money and you do, you have these huge things that are super expensive and super like profound and it's actually not that good. So we try to make the opposite. It, it's a little bit pretentious, I know, but we try to take like garbage and make that garbage like look really good so for example like we went to a like a like a like a how you say that like ferreteria how you say ferreteria cristobal in, in english uh, like, hardware, a hardware a hardware hard, hardware store hardware store so we asked like what what is the cheapest painting that you have so they have this like painting in in a bag like a plastic bag so it's <laughs> supposed to be like like painted to paint your house but it's actually the worst thing that you can use it cost like uh, I don't know, like three dollars, like five liters. And the black one, when you paint, it looks black, and then when it's dry, it it's actually gray, which was really good for the, the film because you have a lot of movements going on because you have the black first, shiny black, and then the gray, and the black again, the gray. That's because the painting was super cheap. So we were trying to use all the cheap materials, you know, like things that were like cheap, easy to cut, fast to dry, and we will not feel guilty about like using like liters and liters of that painting. And when you're working in that process, you kind of have to be okay with the colors of something being different from scene to scene, or is that, is that the process? You cannot be so precious about, you know, cause you, you, the things change, right? The materials change as you're working. Yeah, we, this was a very conscious decision when we started doing animation. It was like, we cannot be, let's say Pixar, we cannot be, we will never be uh, as perfect as, as like American or European or Japanese um, animation, you know? So we have to play using a, like a football soccer word, like we, we have to play local, you know? We have, to, we have to be dirty, we have to be like chaotic, we have to be, cheap you know like the, and 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 try to play these values uh, as like uh, virtues and not like as uh, mistakes you know yeah. right there's a scene in the film uh where uh, maria has this these pigs that become children um and in the in one of the rooms they have um el chavo del ocho for anyone that's from latin america knows you know they have images of like dragon ball z and to me that sort of speaks to perhaps the outside world that's so evil. Um, what was the intention behind having those sort of iconic images in this room with this, this children that she's sort of raising in freedom? Well, I have to say something that apparently like everyone hates El Tabo de Lotto in Mexico. Really? Uh, I mean, I'm Mexican and I, I, I mean, I guess maybe the generation has changed, but. <laughs> okay, okay, you love that. That's good, that's good. Let's clean the table. I uh, know it's, um, we we grow up seeing El Tao de Loto and and I still like enjoy so much these like so cheap effects you know like when you have a guy like going into the wall and the wall was made of pla how you said like a um, of it sorry my I, I, these words are not coming to my head oh, foam foam like foam. Made of foam. foam and you can see this foam and it's basically a pre-made hole of foam and he goes out and all that effects are in my head and all my like you know like i think i, I was talking about rembrandt a few minutes ago you know like i think the table the Lotto is a little bit like rembrandt like you see that it's fake you see that it's a, an, an old guy dressing as a kid 
and you still get like emotion about it and you can be attached to this old guy dressing as a poor little kid and that that double like narrative i think is like we were trying to do that this with the wolf house so you see the wires you see that it's fake but you still can get like uh, the emotion of the film that was that was one side yeah that, that that is one side and like our like very deep admiration for Chespirito the, but also like we were trying to recreate a like media class like uh, house you know a media class Latin American house so that was we, we would take this decision of, of, of having these elements of decoration you know like because like like people in the outside world look this kind of uh, stupid shows also you know like uh, like like these tv shows they they watch tv i don't know like yeah that was that was i think the, the two things but mainly it was our big admiration for this yeah. video <laughs> right um there's some questions from the audience uh, and I'll, right. I'll you know i'll share with you guys some of them um owen felton who hopefully is watching uh says as this is a film rooted in history of uh, uh of political history in Chile or a chapter of that, how do you hope American audiences can connect with, uh, mm. with this story? And what can Americans take away from this, both relating to Chile and, and in the yeah. history of the United States? Essentially, well, how can people can relate to it outside of Chile? Yeah, well, the answer is actually not that difficult. Like we took the case of Colonia Dignidad, which is a, a religious sect in the south of Chile, who was basically ruled by a German, who was a pedophile, who basically like create all this like super creepy world to dominate people and kids. And that can describe a lot of sex in the world. So the film was basically, in a way, was a process of transforming colonial, like the specific case of colonial dignidad in a more like, a, I mean, we, we, we presented as a, as a regular sect in a way, like main, like most of the sects are around a one male, like powerful male guy are like based on like uh, domination, sex and religion. So yeah, that's my answer. I don't know if it's proper. Yeah, I think we, we wanted, we really wanted, we, we tried hard to make an abstract film. You know, we, we don't, we didn't want to make like a film like his, we talked about this in the beginning, but we didn't want to talk, to make a film that is historically correct or something or like, so um, we wanted to make a, an abstract film because we want to make a universal film and a film that everyone in the world can relate to. Like, and, and the, I think you, you, um, everyone's life you can find like repressive figures like from like the from religion politics even especially maybe in your family you will find your parents repressing you like in a nicer way or in a more in a like less nice way um so yeah we wanted i, I think everyone can relate to repression and, and i think that there is something else like i and I think we like as a as a as, as Latin American. This is more like maybe political, but as, as like Latin American like um, filmmakers. I think it's it's funny like to make um, genre films um, connected to politics. I, I'm thinking about like this film of Lincoln versus zombies. I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. you know. So like right. everyone in the world can relate to this film because like we all know like. Um, more or less like uh, American, uh, like US American history. So it's funny like to do the same thing in the, with, with our own history as Latin Americans, you know, like to say like, what the fuck if they don't uh, have the, um, the background, like, the, the historical background to understand this, let's, let's make it, you know, we have the, we have the power to make it. And, and finally, like the, the, it's good if the film um, it's useful for people to get to know about Colonia Dignidad and get yeah. to know about like um, politics in Chile. I think that's great. Right. Um, another question here. Um, I mean, it's a long question, but it, it essentially, I feel like some people that send questions have doubts about 
the scale of the house and the figures mm -hmm. and sort of like how that that worked if you could talk about sort of the, the scale of the figures and the size of the house and the sort of the production of it yeah well i i after the third like screening of the film i started to we, they always ask you like the will you say something about the film in the beginning and i always hate to present the film and said something about the film because i want people to go into the film without any like knowledge but uh, i started to say this like don't be like ex i mean i don't want you to be like uh feeling like uh, anxious about knowing what is the scale of the film so basically it's our like the all the spaces are real size so our real rooms like when you see a furniture it's a real furniture normally like the puppets if you can call that the puppets are like norm more or less like real size we were like really like painting the walls of a real room so it's yeah it's one to one Maybe. Almost. when Almost. you see a, when you see a scale one a scale puppet you will see that we are actually going into a like a small puppet right Chris, you're saying no, no, no. That all, yeah, um, that almost everything is actual size, not not all. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ronald Ronald Gomez wants to know if you have any major inspirations in creating the film, and I feel like you know the film has been compared to the Quay Brothers or uh, yeah. Jorodowski. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot of you know sort of influences. Are there are any of those things that they compare you to actual inspirations? Um, well, I think. Yeah, maybe the, the 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 more accurate one would be David Lynch, even if it was not mentioned among those. But but I think that was like we felt very inspired by talking about filmmakers, you know, because we have a lot, a lot, a lot of inspirations, including Chespirito and many others. But but I think David Lynch, uh, like Eraserhead and the 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 short films are very. I know what all of, all of his films are very like inspirational for us yeah and definitely alejandro Khodorovsky, and definitely yeah like Sven meyer was in the beginning yeah we have a we were like like preparing another presentation and we start to make a list and we were like like 60 pages list yeah, yeah. And can i can i do something i will share oh okay i cannot share my screen doesn't really matter <laughs> Um, another question, Abigail Blaine wants to know: um, Were there supposed to be, were there supposed to be a third pig, or is the third pig the audience? Uh, I think I think the third pig is the audience is a much better answer to to yeah. than the real one. But yeah, there is supposed to be a third pig. It, it's hidden in a scene. I mean, like, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. so is this like a like an Easter egg? What they call you know when there's something hidden in the in in, in the background of the story? Well, actually, no, it's not so hidden. In it's pretty much in front of the camera, but like, yeah, Maybe. nobody. <laughs> wow, no, I, I, I I have to assume that I haven't. I have to rewatch the film to to find the third pig. So that 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 yeah. that hopefully encourages people to watch the film uh, multiple I, times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see if there's any. Any other questions here? Uh, people are very impressed by the paper mache construction. I guess that's how they're referring to the, the technique yeah. you guys use. Um, well, I think that's still from the audience questions. So are you guys, you guys have been making short films together for a while. Has there always been, um, so the same uh, tone to the stories, sort of exploring this uh, darker sort of side uh, in your short films? Mm. Well, I, I have to admit that the, like the dark feeling of the films, are the darky or the like, uh, I don't know, like the, yeah, the dark feeling of the films is the less intellectual and controlled part of our work. Mm. In a way, the Wolf House was, or La Casa Lobo was the the work that we were more aware of that. So, because we're our it was our first future film, we said, okay, we will go 
we know that we will end up with like a dark film. I mean, it's hard for us to 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 do like a shiny, beautiful, like super happy film. It's we don't know why, but we go to the dark, like like nightmare feeling. So how we organize that in a future film to don't be naive and not be like, you know, like, yeah. So we, in a way, part of like, you know, the colonial dignidad presence was linked to that. And yeah, part of the script was trying to take that way of work that we have or the aesthetic that we have or with that we end up having, trying to take that like in control but we don't i don't have an answer for why all our short films are yeah like a dark stories uh yeah someone else asked um and i think you briefly mentioned it earlier but why did you decide to to tell the story from the perspective of the wolf or the cult you know you asked the audience to assume that this is uh that u.s filmmakers were hired by the colony to restore uh this lost film what was the intention behind it? I feel like people want uh, to hear more about that. Well, I think it, it is a strategy that we've been using like, like before for in, in many films, in many short films. We, we started like um, playing, like role playing games when making films, you know, like, and, and this is not something that I think uh, filmmakers do so often or not than we know you know like so like we, we thought it would be like a like a fun idea to do like also because i think this this comes also because we we have the feeling that um in chile most of art and films are made from one political perspective or ideological perspective and we thought um, it's not so challenging for the audience and it's not so challenging as filmmakers to do this. You know, everyone making art is um, progressive and liberal and, you know, and, and everyone like uh, consuming this art is also so, you know, so it would be more, it, it is more challenging for us to try to um, dress the skin of a um, of the guys of, of very far away people ideologically you know and and yeah that, that that's that was the i think maybe the one of the main end motivations for doing this yeah there is a there is a rule when you are writing a script like a a rule or like a recommendation that says that if you have a character that you really don't like or a really bad one you know the of the film you should like know that character and love that character to kind of make a more profound character. So I, we choose to do that with the director of the film. So we will choose the worst character of the film and we will make that character the director. Uh, and that make that lead us to, to a more profound and problematic perspective, you know, like, as Cristobal said, like when you go to a museum, and if you are like pro-feminist, like liberal, democratic, kind of left-wing, you know, like person, and you go to into a museum, and everything in the museum says to you, you should be feminist, you should be lefty, you should be liberal, and you go out and you are the same person that you were before going in, I think there is a mistake or a failure in that. So we were we found like funny and interesting to dress the skin of our really our person and try to understand that. There is them out of that. Someone has asked if there was a specific inspiration for the characters. I don't know if they mean perhaps you know how they look. Is were there any any inspirations physically or in any way? Uh, Did you answer that, Chris or me? <laughs> Oh yeah, I can, I can answer that. Like, uh, like um, Maria was inspired <laughs> by, <laughs> by the, the girlfriend I had at the at the time we started making the film. That was the, the Maria's look, you know. Like, mm, it's not the proper answer. I have to. Say. No, 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 that's the answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really, that's the answer. Okay, that's fine. That's really okay. Like um, uh, I have one last question uh, for you guys. Um. 
you know, I think it's interesting, you know, the 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 voiceover, the narration of, of the film, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't know if for, for English speakers that saw the film, you know, with subtitles, uh, might not be so clear that the characters shift between German and Spanish and that, that Spanish that they speak is very accented, you know, with a German accent. So tell us mm -hmm. a little bit about the casting, you know, those specific voices and, and the language sort of shift between uh, throughout the story. Yeah, well, one thing that we, because we imagined that the film was made by the colony, we, we had to assume that the film like trying to be realistic, we had to assume that the film was also narrated by the people in the colony. So we had this uh, actress, Amalia Kasai, and she's yeah, amazing. Have... At that point, she was... Uh, Chris. Just one thing, I have to explain something. Like people in the colony, even, yeah. even if they established themselves in Chile in the 60s, they are still now, the last uh, people living there, they still speak German. And, and, and when they speak Spanish, they speak with a very strong uh, German accent. Yeah. So like, even like, the, I, I had the opportunity to be in the colony like a couple of times and I, I spoke to the people there and they speak with this really, really, I would say even a stronger accent than the, the one you hear in the film. I'll do that. So yeah, basically like, um, the idea that was that the, when you, you have this like, German people speaking Spanish sometimes, and the Spanish that you hear is like a, with a strong German. So Amalia Casai was like, she made like the Maria's voice and Pedro and Ana's voice. Uh, so she was a hard casting uh, because we, we needed a, an actress, a boy actress, a voice actress that we liked, but she also need to have a, like a Chilean accent, like a perfect, if you can have that Chilean accent, and also a German accent without the South American feeling. And she had that because she was like a, she's a German Chilean person. And at that point she was living in Berlin. So yeah. And, oh, and uh, the, the narrator, like Paul Schaeffer, you will say, oh, the wolf, is actually a visual sound artist. And I can, I can tell you the story how we get him uh, involved with the project. We, I was like uh, in a Chinese restaurant after an opening, and he, because he was an, he's an artist, uh, Rainer Krause, he was also in that table, and I was like eating my Chinese food, and at some point I hear this voice, and he was talking about something, with this like chi deep Chilean accent and also deep German accent, and I said to myself, I think this is the voice. So I invite him to have a yeah a record like a yeah to have a rehearsal, and he was great because also he was a he is a sound artist so it was so easy to work with him. You will say to him like so technical things like with more air slow slowly like take your voice a little bit like bigger and he was like doing that. Yeah. And the, the more narrative explanation of it, it's that the, when you hear the, them talking between each other, like Maria and the narrator, when they talk between each other, they speak in German. Mm. When they speak to us, they speak in Spanish. Because the film is supposed to be a propaganda film, you know. So that's mm. the why, why they jump. And at some point, they kind of get like confused and they mix up German and Spanish. But that's the main rule. Cristobal, did you say that you actually visited the colony? Was that, what was the purpose behind that? Did, in, what did that bring you? <laughs> did it bring you something interesting for the story, visiting the colony? Well, it, it was very useful actually. It was, um, I, the purpose was doing research actually and, and, it, and it was doing, and it was um, at the time we were making the film. So it was, um, first of all, it was, well, very, um, well, the colony is, is now turned into a kind of a resort, into a hotel and restaurant, and they would even like, um, I don't know, pe pe people of the zone would uh, get married there. It's very, very, very weird. And it's mm. like Auschwitz turned mm. into a resort, you know, like, mm. um, and and I had the because I, I don't know at the, at the time of the of Paul Schaeffer of the of the leader when when he was alive around three hundred people were living in the colony and now all 
only like 100 people remain there and it's still very interesting to talk to them it was very inspiring for writing the the dialogues um, and also like uh, getting to know the the facilities the installations there it was also really like um, you have like a completely different perspective it's a, it's a very super like a uh, loaded dark um, place also like um, secretly i i i made some recordings for the atmospheres of the like the audio recordings for the film um so yeah it was very very inspiring not in a nice way but yeah very inspiring for the film yeah. uh, i had said that was the last question but just briefly uh, i didn't mention the 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 honey which i think is a very interesting part not just because you know it's the the thing that they sell and that connects them to the german colony to the chilean population that may buy this honey but you know it sort of feels like there's a metaphor in that honey too in sort of like the the, the sweetness of the image outside uh was that something taken directly from the actual colony well, well, yes. I mean, they, they would produce honey. They still do, and they they still do produce honey. And you can actually buy the bread of the colony, like in the corner of my house. There is a big supermarket, and I, I someone bring that to me as a joke for my birthday. <laughs> uh, I I had I never bought that terrible bread. I mean, it's really good the bread, but. Who cares about the quality of the bread? Uh, they they used to also have a like like a restaurant in the, in the highway, which was really popular. Cristobal went there. My yeah, my father-in-law went there when he was a kid. You know, like people used to stop in the in the this like a uh, restaurant to have this really nice German food with like blonde people like going to your table. You know, so they they used to they still produce, but they they used to produce like a lot of products for to, for sale yeah mm. and we had this like honey thing going around the film and i have to be honest we we were like having all this honey like being like you know like the the, the, the material to to make like the characters become healthier and more blonde yeah. and we show the film to some friends and a friend andres kalavsky who is a genius i have to say he said to us like Hey, this looks like a like an advertisement advertisement of honey of the colony that became really strange. Yeah, Why don't you start with the like this as a like a honey advertisement? So we said that's yeah, that's just perfect. But we thought I mean like th there were many things of it. I think like the, the we had like um, of course a very plastic. Um, like a very visual and material film and, and we had the we wanted to have this kind of matter uh, like a magic matter that uh, maria would use to transform the um, the beings the 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 um, the, the pigs you know the and of course this had to have like a kind of material connection to to her um, quality to her blondness you can you say that like to her to her being blonde you know like and um, yeah, I think because it, the, the, all the film it's it's basically a very like horrible joke um, about about racism, I think, and uh, about like um, the, like the, the the thing with the pigs. They, they we decided to use pigs as the these animals. One of the reasons was because we we heard we heard that the the Germans in the colony would call the Chileans pigs, you know, Schweine, and and we we. We we thought okay, this let's make them pigs, you know, let's make Chileans pigs in the film. Um, I don't know, I went really far away, but 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 yeah, you, we we wanted to have this kind of like um, material thing to to transform um, Anna and Pedro through the film. <laughs> wow, I mean, I, I didn't. That that's an interesting element, the whole idea of like Chileans being called pigs by the Germans and yeah. feeling like you know they're living near them but they feel superior in a way so that's very yeah exactly exactly yeah. for me okay I, I will tell a story about maybe i'm making a mistake but i remember like the first time i went to new york i was uh going i, I was in the metropolitan museum i think it's called mm -hmm. sorry the map yeah uh, yeah and i was in an air in a room 
and they were like the you know like it was uh, like the Indians room and then I went to the area of I don't remember the order of the thing but it was like a, yeah, the Indians and then was the monkeys or something like that and, and then I started to like link the two rooms and like why are those two rooms like so close to each other like there is a link between indians and monkeys like not it's not it's a little bit like incorrect no like to link right right yeah okay so we found that it was funny to make this like super stupid like thing that pigs people with black hair blonde people and that's like the way that you know like evolution goes which is really stupid of course a bad joke but it worked in the film so we were like yeah of course pigs genius pigs and then like becoming like sort of genius averaging like me you know like and then well, i'm not averaging i guess but or, or or i am i don't know and then like being blonde that was the moment okay i'm going to a deep big shit thing sorry <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I'm you, seeing, like, you still laughing, laughing, like, why are you doing this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's been a great conversation. Thank you for giving yeah. us so much of your time. Um, uh, really, really appreciate it. And I, hopefully those that connected and join us uh, got to learn more about the film. So thank you so much, uh, Cristobal and Joaquin. Thank you. Thank you. And thank thanks, you. Ian, for the, organizing this. And thanks. Thank you to Kimstein, yeah. For being with the film to the US and hosting this.